welcome world. One, two, three, and to the folks. Snoop Doggy Dog and Dr. Dre is at the door. Ready to make an entrance, so back on up. Cause you know we're about to rip shit up. Give me the microphone first so I can burst like a bubble. Jason from Grand Nye, uh, you're live here on Facebook Live. How are we doing today? Good, Kevin. How are you? Fantastic. You know, it's, it's really nothing but a G thing, and it's really nothing but G diapers on this episode today. I try. So that's what we <laughs> want to talk about. So I'm just going to give people a little background about how I was able to meet you. And oh, yeah. so to give people some background, uh, my best friend Tucker and I were able to meet up with Jason and his wife, Kim Graham Nye, at their old, is it your old location in Portland, Oregon? Oh, no, it's still very much our location now. That's okay. our U.S. headquarters. Okay, so still live, still live as this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so give people a little uh, background. It was the day after 4th of July. Tucker and I were, you know, rushing to get out of our houses from, you know, the the previous night celebrating America, we got to the headquarters uh, and were able to learn about the incredible journey of G diapers. And it's so fascinating because at that time I knew little to nothing, literally little to nothing about sustainability. You know, I was given this internship and my job was to go around and interview social entrepreneurs and learn about how they got to where they are condense their 30 minute videos and down to three minutes, call them shortcuts. But I didn't really know anything about sustainability. And it wasn't until we interviewed you and Kim that we got to learn about how a company can really be successful, but have, you know, sustainable and purposeful principles in them. So I'm going to pass it on to you. And I want you to kind of explain to our audience, well, who is G diapers? What is it? And what's the background story? Yeah, thanks. Um, well, we didn't know much about sustainability either, um, and we had uh, we had a circuitous route to the uh, the C suite of a diaper company. Um, I, I started out in Japan and uh, as a stockbroker in Tokyo, um, and my major in, Jap in university was Japanese, and yeah, it was a two or three years of making a lot of money but no meaning, um, and so I, I switched out and did a degree at night in education and became a school teacher teaching Japanese back here in Sydney, Australia. And that made a lot of meaning, but no money. <laughs> and right. this theme started developing. It's like, God, is there a work opportunity where I could make meaning and money? Right. And right around then I met my, my then girlfriend, now wife, and she was on the same journey. She had gone to Zanzibar, Australia and uh, happened upon a startup that was really successful financially, but pretty meaningless. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we met, uh, she's from Canada. I'm here from Sydney. And so I showed her around Sydney and we went dating 200 times and wrote a book called Great Dates, A Romantic's Guide to Sydney. There you go. And that then, yeah, that morphed into an event management business where we organize once in a lifetime events for 100 times. You typically end up with a couple of kids. And that was the moment we read the statistic that one disposable diaper takes 500 years to buy a grade. There's a cup of oil in every diaper. Um, you know, in the US, 20 billion diapers get put in landfill every year but they're only used by 5% of the population. So that was kind of the epiphany. Mm. Uh, found some clever technology in Tasmania, uh, which is the island south of Australia. Uh, and we, we used that product with our first son, who's now 16. And we liked the product so much. It was plastic free. You could home compost the wet ones only. You could flush them. And so we loved it. So we bought the rights to the IP mm. to the rest of the world outside of Australia and New Zealand. We were old, we were like 34, so we weren't kind of young. Um, and we said, yeah, let's do it. And we couldn't get the rights to Australia and New Zealand because the inventor was keen to keep this, these territories. So we got work visas and raised a bit of angel money here and moved to Portland, Oregon, because we thought Portland was the green capital of the world, and uh, which I think it is. Right. And uh, we built a brand called G, and G is groovy and green and global and goo goo and gaga. And we've got a team in Portland. We had manufacturing in the U.S. for a, a great deal of time. We just shifted that over to uh, China. Um, and then we, we started in retail in the U.S., expanded into the U.K. and Europe. And here we are 14 years later. And here you are two years later after I was able to interview. You know, what's, what's kind of changed, right. yeah. <laughs> what's, what's changed in those two years? 
you know, since we last saw you. Yeah. So, yeah. So we, we felt we, we relocated back to Australia uh, to get the kids into school in Australia. And um, we have our team in Portland, Oregon, focusing on the g business. And uh, Kim and I uh, sort of went back into the garage and uh, came out with uh, new IP, uh, World First Plastic Free uh, Baby Diapers. Um, and the focus of that is really moving from a consumer business to a, a service that we call G-Cycle. And exactly. it's, uh, it's a trial we're about to start. We've done one trial here and we've done a few trials actually. We partner with childcare centers. We sell them these new kinds of plastic free baby diapers. We collect them each week and then we take them off site and we can commercially compost them and sell the compost. Uh, we can put them through an anaerobic digester. We can do a bunch of things with the back end and actually create a resource out of waste. Right. And it really goes to this product idea of cradle, the cradle product design. And it's really the heart is the circular economy. So, you know, we've had since the industrial age, it's a linear economy. You take, make and waste. You take from the planet. So you extract oil, you make stuff like baby diapers that uses a cup of oil. And then three hours later, that product goes straight back into landfill for 500 years. So that's really not going to work for the long term. So a circular economy is where you think carefully about the upstream materials. So we use cornstarch in our product. We, it's used as normal, but then we take it back at the end and we want to monetize that waste. Okay. So that's kind of the new thing. And Kim's actually over in London now and uh, trial's getting set up. And um, it's really timely. You know, the EU has just announced a directive that they're phasing out landfill in 12 years' time and they're introducing extended producer responsibility, which means if, if I sell you a baby diaper, I have to take that baby diaper back and do something with it. And if it's plastic, it's really hard to do anything with it. I mean, as we know through, the, you know, David Attenborough tells us by 2050, there'll be more plastic in the ocean than sea, sea life. Plastic, every piece of plastic ever made will always be here. And so by changing out materials and design, we've got a product that's really cradle to cradle. It's regenerative. And that's the key thing. Yeah. And so plastics are becoming a they big yeah. big issue and, and even this year it's really starting to pick up you know you see the movement yeah. even with plastic straws less people yeah. using plastic straws um but what does that do for your business when more consumers are, are being conscious about what they're buying and how their products are creating an impact in the environment yeah i mean it's just giving us another string to our bow where we can actually work with childcare centers and they're they're buying the product and then ultimately want to figure out a way to sell direct to consumer and have a, a collection service right out of a, a family home and we've partnered with a really clever company in the uk that's developed it's kind of like the uber app but for for, for diapers of all things where you can oh, just really? order diapers on demand and then you can order you can you can uh, have the soil diapers collected from your home within like a two-hour window and why that's important is that if you have one child in diapers in your household, half your weekly garbage is baby diapers. Really? Well, I mean, yeah. I would never know. I've so never that's had a kid, crazy. So. Don't plan on <laughs> any time soon either, but. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, what's interesting for us, the real vision here after 14 years, you know, in the U.S., you know, distribution very much focused on the premium end. You know, you, you're using materials that aren't as cheap as plastic and so you end up like a lot of natural organic products they end up just serving the higher socioeconomic families which we've never felt comfortable with we want this product to be available to every single mum and dad in america and globally so by monetizing the waste by by generating revenue from the compost that we create by selling it at the end we want to bring the price point of these diapers down mm. and and compete very solidly with plastic alternatives. Yeah. And, and is that the biggest issue? I know a lot of sustainable companies that we've been able to speak with, you know, it's really hard to compete when these other companies are making the materials for so cheap and it's not sustainable. And the companies that are sustainable have to have a higher price because the products are a little bit more, um, you know, pricey. So you're saying that as time goes on, the price will be going down. Um, and how big of an impact will that have on your business in terms it's of- It's really significant. Like you know, we, we've got a we've got a sale on at the moment re leading up to Halloween on the G diapers business, mm. and you can just see how price affects consumers. Which is fair enough. If you're a parent, you're going to buy five thousand diapers, and they're they're not they're kind of they're expensive. They can be expensive, and so 
we live in a society where cheap, cheap and easy, right. <laughs> cheap and convenient, it wins every time. And so, yeah, a lot of products you see in Whole Foods, um, they're, they're expensive. Organic, the organic um, ingredients are expensive. Alternative materials to avoid plastic is expensive. So price is massive. And after this pretty long, you know, 14 years isn't a short period of time and really looking at the market, what we realized was, boy, if we can, you know, if we can do a better job competing on price and then how do you do that? Um, by monetizing waste at the back end, that's definitely one way of doing it. Um, so that's that's what we're after. And now I'm not even gonna attempt to, you know, make you think that I know anything about, you know, the gig economy or anything like that. But you've mentioned that a company in the UK is delivering is the Uber for delivering diapers to homes. How has the gig economy? So people just being able to be self-employed, like Uber, like Postmates. How is that? affecting the industry how is that helping out you know companies like yours yeah i mean the company i mentioned in the uk they all i've done is just well i've done a great thing they've developed an app but they they we're kind of partnering with them to get them to scale so they've got they've got access to uh some electric vehicles and we're focusing on you know small villages at this point and they'll scale ultimately but the gig economy is really interesting and you know we've got um We've been looking at China very closely, and China is just a wash in these delivery pickup things because there's no there's nowhere to put waste in a in a in a high rise um, apartment, say in China. So you've got all these companies, what not just one or two, but heaps of them that are on demand, pickup delivery waste, obviously the food category, um, and yeah, I think it's really feeding into convenience for parents and you know of all the category of all the different consumers out there parents are exhausted and they're desperate for convenience because they're you know particularly mums early on i mean they're just so sleep deprived so anything that can deliver them convenience is going to be popular mm. so 50 million diapers a day go into landfills and like kim just said on the shortcut is that's 50 million today 50 million tomorrow <laughs> 50 million yesterday it's unsustainable and that's, that's, and that's america right it's just america and that's just baby diapers and you got to think you've got an aging population everywhere and so the adult diaper category is going to catch up you know japan just reached that that uh that crossing point where now in japan they've, they, they sell more adult diapers in japan than baby diapers so yeah it's completely unsustainable mm. we've got now, to change now you're running into um, you know, the, the purchasing issue. Now, what's one thing that you maybe have run into internally? Um, but, you know, I to do, you know, with my work with um, being a woman's, even a woman's basketball equipment manager, you know, everyone has an internal battle sometimes. And, and sometimes it takes leadership um, to get out of those struggles, to get out of that path that you're heading down. Um, could you kind of tell our audience about a story um, or an example that um, G diapers maybe faced early on in the stage? Um, and was it ever a struggle or that was there ever a moment where you figured, you know what, this is just too hard of an area to compete in? Oh, sure. <laughs> it's like a thousand of those. <laughs> um, you know, everything from uh, we had a, we were raising a series A round of funding and uh, yeah, we had a we had an investor that we had really gotten to know well, and he uh, he actually tragically passed away the day before funding. Oh no! And we hadn't launched a product. We just we we'd been in the states about a year, and I remember Kim and I looking at each other, going, "Wow, this this journey's over before it even started." And it was only through the amazing graces of an Australian angel investor who we uh, met before we left, and he through an exchange of seven emails because it was the middle of the night over here. That he he came in and saved the day. So yeah, that was mm. one example. Um, other examples, though, yeah, I mean, you know, the two thousand eight recession depression was huge. You know, the the sustainability essentially died in that year. You know, we had Earth Day since nineteen seventy. You had Time Magazine announcing, you know, Hero for the Environment every year. Every every breakfast show, you know, we cold called NBC's Today Show and got on there and. It was huge. And then come the recession, you know, and since that, you know, sustainability is a word. It's kind of, kind of died a little bit. And, you know, people associate it with being expensive and not working as well. Um, 
And uh, that was a huge challenge. And a good example is when, you know, we, you know, we came to the whole business as, you know, with beginner mindset, right? I'm a high school teacher and now I'm going to run a, a diaper company. Right. Um, right. So, you know, the business plan, we did the research and said, okay, this is, Amazon was still only selling CDs and books, so they weren't even a factor. Mm -hmm. The number one account we had to get into, like if we didn't get into this account, we were not a business, was Babies Are Us. Babies so Are ba Us. Babies Are Us, right? And so 90% of all new parents registered their, their, their gift registry was at Babies Are Us. Mm -hmm. And we said, we've got to get in there. And we got in there and we thought, we're pretty awesome. And then <laughs> over time, as Amazon came in, you know, we knew we were, it was concerning when the Babies Are Us buyer is asking us, well, what should we do about Amazon? And we're like, but wait, your Babies Are Us, don't you know what to do with Amazon? Exactly. Um, and then, you know, we were, it, it got pretty clear that their, their business model wasn't going to uh, be around for much longer. So we had to make a really hard call and actually pull out a Babies Are Us and leave a huge amount of money on the table, um, which we did. And lo and behold, I think uh, this year or late last year, they, they went into Chapter 11 bankruptcy. Right. That I was a really that. hard decision. Well, I saw that because uh, when you're growing up, at least people my age, uh, Toys R Us is where it's at, man. That's where I'm getting my GI Joes. That's where I'm getting my, my trading yeah. cards, my you know sports cards, yeah. you know, whatever. And then when you see something like that, and just like you're saying, Amazon wasn't even a thing. And then you have... Babies are us. Is this is where we're gonna go? And then now you look at it. Chapter eleven filed for bankruptcy. Times are changing. Times are yeah. definitely indeed changing. Yeah. And and I think from a leadership standpoint, one of the things is that idea of constantly having to look at the horizon. And if you lose, if you miss a couple of product cycles, or you miss a couple of things, you really get behind really quickly. And you know, for us, you know, the category is really hard. And there's 6,000 patents in, a, in any one diaper. So Kimberly Clark and Procter & Gamble have patented the category, the product to death since they started the category in 1960. But it's all sort of iterations, right? It's relying on polypropylene, just regular plastic. They've made it lighter, more absorbent, but really protected from an IP standpoint. So to get in there with IP is really hard work, but we've done that. Um, I think what's interesting is, um, uh, where the world's going. So these new EU laws, you know, the winds of change are blowing, particularly in Europe around plastic and how they're going to manage the waste. And then last week at the Conservative conference in the UK, the British um, Environment Minister said, well, we might be looking at taxing plastic diapers, which is kind of huge, right? Yeah, but he said, we've got to deal with this waste problem and we might need to do some price signalling and tell parents to use alternatives. So that that's massive and, you know, unexpected. But for us, we've got to be constantly looking. I think the job of founders and CEOs and leaders is to look at, look to the horizon because you can get really stuck in the day-to-day -day and not realize where the world's going. Interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and well, if, I know you can go on a site and it has like the world population tracker. Yeah. And you just look at that thing and it just goes. I mean, these babies are just being pumped out. I mean, these human beings and they're just going at it every day. And peep and babies and miniature people are coming out and they all need diapers. Since day one, they all need diapers. And that's why 50 million in the United States alone, United States alone are going into landfill. Yeah. The coming tsunami is actually Japan, where Japan, sorry, China. So they've just ended their single child policy and um, they're four times as big as is the US from a population standpoint. And just like India, China is just desperate to join the middle classes and beyond. And so, you know, I look at that and go, well, if we can be a part of a solution that avoids the kind of errors that the West has made from this linear take, make, wait, waste economy if we can drill circular economy principles into some of those markets then we've done a, a job and we actually met with the environment minister from china last uh, this year and one of the beauties of a controlled economy of a centralized a centralized country where you know the government says stuff and everyone just does it right is right. if they say we're going to back the circular economy then it happens and lo and behold china since 1998 has been talking about and starting to move in this direction so they own all the waste management they own the child care centers they own everything and so working in china could potentially be a big accelerant because you know for us you know we're working in the uk and europe and you know things are a little bit 
you know, regulations don't keep up with reality and all those sorts of things. But yeah, I mean, China just from a pure birth rate standpoint um, is is huge. Now you're a little bit closer to China than we are. Uh, you're not just up the road, mate. Just up the just road, up and the they're road. doing a lot of things um, to make their economy sustainable. Now, at least I've read, um, and that's all in efforts to compete. And uh, by 2030, with all the talk about the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, China is almost the example country to be looking at in terms of what their government are doing to implement these restrictions and, and laws um, to, you know, mitigate the uh, damage that co2 has done um, in their country especially in those big cities where they make you know new york city look like a, a small you know country town um so that's interesting Absolutely. how yeah. like, i guess another question i would like our our viewers to know is what's what's china doing for you going forward i mean what do you have to look at in china kind of what you just said um to make plans for your business going forward it's so interesting like I think back when we started and we dropped probably a hundred and something thousand dollars on a website and which today is ludicrous, um, but it was 2004. And in China, it's like, yeah, not a website, not of this, not of that. It's, it's a WeChat. It's, it's WeChat. It's, it's, and you know, WeChat is the marriage of um, eBay, PayPal, WeChat. Amazon. Do you know? Yeah. WeChat. We, w E chat. W W E chat is WeChat. just what drives the economy in China. So you can do everything on this thing. You can pay for stuff through a payment thing. You can buy products, sell products. You can date. There's a bit of Tinder going on in there. Um, you can do all sorts of stuff with WeChat. So when we started talking um, with Chinese partners, that that's that's the path we're going on. We're not building a website. We're just going on WeChat. And the you know Tmall and Taobao are just massive. And uh, so that's that's what we're doing. Um, and uh, China loves U.S. brands, and uh, I think they're showing a lot more leadership than probably every any other country around those sustainable development goals. Mm. Um, you know, we uh, you see what happens there. I mean, they are the factory of the world, and if they've got dignitaries coming in town, they'll shut down factories in a particular area, to kind of mitigate um, pollution, air pollution, just to give it a better look. So they're they know that isn't sustainable and they're looking for ways and means to do things differently for sure. Interesting. That's really interesting stuff, especially, you know, as a you know young adult, you don't care about this stuff. I mean, this stuff just doesn't affect you, but you know, when you're running a business like G diapers, you know, you got to pay attention to these things. And so thanks for answering those questions. It really, you know, enlightens me and, and I'm sure our viewers and kind of what's going on in the world and how, you know, even tariffs are affecting, you know, businesses like yours um, going forward. But nevertheless, to more to people that are entering the workforce and are, you know, wanting to align their passions, their skills with the career, you know, wanting to take that step into sustainability, but you know, aren't really too sure about if they are going to be able to make a living, if they're going to be able to pay their bills, you know, what advice, you know, having been there before, would you give to them, um, you know, to take that next step? Yeah. And I really empathize and recognize that because that's what I did. It's not like I left school and said, okay, let's go and make diapers. Like I, I didn't get to this till I was 34. Mm. And I really think that observation that Steve Jobs makes is true, which is as you, you know, as you travel through life, it might feel in the moment when you're in this particular job, well, how does this work? But as you go through life and you listen to your own heart and move and make, make decisions, as you look back on your life, you start connecting the dots and it all starts to make sense. So, you know, for me, my early passion was Japan and I never could figure out like, that's a huge investment of time to get fluent in a, in that language. And lo and behold, like last week, um, you know, I've had my first meetings uh, with strategic partners in Japan speaking Japanese, which I haven't done since we started the company 14 years ago. Um, and there's opportunities up in Japan to talk about what we're doing and sustainability and those sorts of things. Um, so I think if you have a, a North Star of what you want, it's okay not to know exactly how you're going to get there from day one. But as long as you hang on to that North Star and know that's where you really want to head to, then um, just trust that you you'll get there in the end. But it's 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 it's. I think every I think human beings are wired to want certainty, and the reality is life is fundamentally uncertain. 
So the things you can hang on to and make certain, like, you know, you've got a North Star, you've got a personal mission to do something. Um, as long as you're moving towards that, then things tend to work out. So is the first thing they should do is create that North yeah. Star, find out what's important to them and exactly. follow that? Okay. What, what, what sort of a, what dent do you want to leave in the universe? What contribution do you want to make? And I think it's about, you know, your skills and talents. Like you could be a good communicator or a good engineer or a good software developer and, well, how can I do that um, for, the, for, the, for the betterment of the planet? And it's funny for us, right? So we, we market to parents. So in 2004, we were marketing to ourselves. So we're now 48. So we're Gen X. Well, now we're marketing to Gen Y. We're marketing to millennials. And I, millennials get such a hard time. I think, I'm not sure if it's just in Australia, but they just get so criticized for, you know, how they work and whatever. I just think they're, they're wired in such a more promising way than I think my generation. And I think they intuitively get um, that bot companies need to be triple bottom line. Companies need to be B corporations. Companies need to look after people, profit and planet. Whereas in our, you know, when we started, we have to bang on about sustainability and this and that. And I look at brands today and it's just embedded. And if it's not embedded, the response from a millennial consumer is what's wrong with you? Right. I have, I have great hope. Yeah, I do too. And it's, it's really fascinating, you know, covering all of this stuff, you know, being a part of this movement and getting to interview companies like yours and to, you know, sustainable bricks, you know, it, it's fun getting to see the movement and it's fun um, seeing millennials and Gen Zers become involved every single day. Um, so yeah. That, Can I ask you, what, what are you seeing with real leaders in the community? Is there particular trends or something that you see going forward? The biggest trend for me is the first trend that I asked you about, and that's the, the conscious uh, consumption. You know, right. people, especially my age, are becoming way more aware of their impact of what they're buying. Um, right. So, you know, we, I think we just had a sponsorship deal with uh, Unilever, and I had the ability to interview a consultant for Unilever, and he was telling me he's good friends with the founder or the CEO of Unilever right now, and talking to them about why Unilever is making all these changes in their advertising and their marketing and um, their production to, you know, have the society and the environment in mind. So right. they're making the soap, they're making, you know, whatever those products are called, <laughs> they're making those. Yeah. How is that going to have an impact and why are they doing that? Well, because people are caring more because people yeah. one day will look back at that company and say, Hey, they had it right. And yeah. the biggest thing for him is I'm doing this for my grandsons was what he told yeah. that consultant. So the consultant is telling me, you know, these, there are these mega trends going on. They teach them in the business schools, but at the end of the day, it's really tough to get somebody to take that next step and to go into that route. Um, so to answer your question, to wrap that up, uh, conscious consumer trends are the big things that I'm definitely seeing um, in, in terms of what is going on in the world today. That's here. <laughs> definitely. We need. Well, well, I hope it goes further. I keep it. I hope it keeps going. So yeah. by the time I'm a parent, uh, there's going to be, you know, more uh, G diapers out there, but you know, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll make sure I'm loyal to you guys. Don't worry. <laughs> Beautiful. All right, Jason. Hey, well, hey, we appreciate your time. And it's it's eleven thirty there right now in Australia. Nearly breakfast time on Thursday. I got to tell your U.S. listeners the future is bright. Tomorrow is fantastic. I've experienced it. You're gonna have a great day tomorrow. I'm gonna have a great day tomorrow. <laughs> See, that's, that's what we do here, real leaders. We inspire the future by bringing the future to you. That's what we do. That's what we're all about, baby. Cool. All right. Well, that wraps it up here for uh, the Facebook Live with uh, Jason Graham Nye. And how's Kim doing, by the way? She's great. Yep, she's uh, in London and she's coordinating this trial and uh, she's great and uh, kids are missing her and I'm missing her. But yeah, everything's pretty good. Good to hear. Good to hear. Good to hear. All right, Jason. Thanks so much, Kim. your Kevin. time. Great catching up and best of luck with G-Diapers. Let's, let's Thanks. keep you guys posted. Thanks. Bye-bye. All right, cheers. All right, folks. Well, that wraps it up with Jason Graham Nye from G-Diapers. Um, I hope you liked it. Uh, we had one question a day and the advice, uh, the question was from Noel Williford. He asked, what advice do you have for a business trying to tackle an environmental issue? 
Noah, if I would have seen that question earlier, I would have asked it. But I'm not paying attention. I'm paying attention to the people that I'm talking to on Skype. So unfortunately, this is our well, fortunately, this is our first podcast. So appreciate you all tuning in. Thanks for asking the questions and stay tuned next time because tomorrow um, we are going live with um, the Vice President of Public Policy and Communications from Postmates, Vikram Meyer. All right. So stay tuned for tomorrow, 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific time live here uh, on the Real Leaders Magazine. Folks, if you want to know more and see more about G Diapers, um, go to either realleaders.com and search G Diapers. Go to YouTube and um, search, uh, I think the title is 50 Million Reasons to, to Give it S uh, hashtag I or exclamation mark T. You know what I'm talking about. Or go online to um, and just search G Diapers. Learn more. Get your diapers there. And folks, um, be aware of what products you're buying and how they're making an impact on the world. All right. So that's going to wrap it up tomorrow, 10 a.m. Vice Presidents of Postmates coming to you live. All right, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Goodbye. Keep it real.